Well, I encourage you to grab your Bibles and uh, turn to the first chapter of the Gospel of John as we continue this Believe series. And if you're just joining us or uh, missed a couple weeks, just want to do some truth and review, uh, some of the things we talked about last week, as we really want to encourage one another and encourage our hearts, our own hearts, to believe this gospel, to believe these words that the, uh, John the Apostle wrote down for us. Uh, we talked last week about our faith in God. You know, how, how does anyone come to faith in anything? How do you come to faith in God? And when it comes to God, because he's almighty God, unseen, uh, we think that faith has to be mystical, like we need an experience of some sort to really implant faith within us. But what we have what we learned from Scripture and what we said last week is that faith is actually the acceptance of testimony. And the idea of bearing witness or giving testimony is throughout the New Testament and, and especially here in John. We will see it throughout this gospel as we study it. It doesn't take a, a mystical experience. It takes reading the testimony that has been written down and saying, I believe what these people are saying about Jesus. And that he is God in the flesh, the one who has shown us the Father through his own life. And more than just shown us the Father, he has paved the way of salvation through his own blood. That his death, his burial, his resurrection was for us so that we could be adopted children in, in, uh, in God, you know, one of his kids. Um, in the Gospel of John and throughout the New Testament, testimony is given and it's preserved. Just like in a courtroom setting, people you know, swear on the Bible and to tell the whole truth, not what the truth, so help us God. And then the testimony is written down in a court record or in a book, and that's what's going on here in the New Testament. And last week we talked about uh, John the forerunner, John the Baptist, we sometimes know him as, and his testimony that has been given. And today we're going to look at the second part of what he said about Jesus. Last week we, he, we read the text where he said, Jesus is the light of the world. This light shines in the darkness. The darkness does not overcome it. John said he is the light of the world. And John's testimony was preserved in this book that the Apostle John wrote down for us. Are you keeping your Johns all straight? Okay, good. Uh, and the testimony is written down so that we could read it and understand it and come to faith in it and to believe what is being said. Faith is the acceptance of this testimony. And if you read through the Gospel of John, you're going to have the opportunity to believe it or not believe it. Nobody, not even God himself, is twisting anybody's arm to believe this testimony about Jesus. If you read through the Gospel of John you'll find yourself either believing it or dismissing it. Either it's trustworthy and true or it's the greatest lie of all time. You come to faith in it. If you get to the end of it and you say, I actually, I believe this, that, my friends, is faith. That's faith. Uh, we talked about how Paul said in Romans 10, a great passage, but he gets to the end of it and he says, consequently, faith comes from hearing this is important. Our faith in God comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So as you're hearing the message, even today, if you've not said yes to Jesus, hearing the message proclaimed, that's why the church for 2,000 years has always proclaimed the message, because faith comes by hearing this word about Christ. So we're getting to the second part. Actually, it's days two and three of John the forerunner, uh, what he was testifying about Jesus. So we pick it up in John 1, verse 29. We know it's days two and, two and three because uh, John, the gospel writer, says the next day. So we had you know, uh, all that went on with the religious leaders coming in and questioning John and John giving this testimony of who he was and who he wasn't and then saying Jesus is the light. That all happened on day one. Now we get to the next day, day two, and we'll even get to day three. So the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here's the testimony, okay? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water 
was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I... And I myself did not know him, but the one who was sent to me, sent me to baptize with water, told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with his, two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So here we have days two and three of John's you know, recorded testimony about Jesus. And these 30 verses that we've read last week and today, these are all given to John the Baptist's testimony about Christ. And it ends with this great clarity. In verse 34, John says, I, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. This is him. He says, Behold, look, the Lamb of God. And he said, this is, this is the one. This is the chosen one, which goes in line with the Apostle John's whole purpose for writing the book. Remember, we've said this each week. In the end of the gospel where Jesus, or John says about Jesus that he performed many other signs which are not recorded in this book. But these are recorded, he says, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's through this belief in Jesus, having faith in what has been said about him, that there's life, new life, eternal life found in the powerful, wonderful name of Jesus. I don't know what you're living for these days. I hope that it's, I hope it's God. I hope you're living for Jesus. There is, because if you are, then you're experiencing this eternal life. Eternal life does not begin when we you know, let go of this earthly body and go into his presence. John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they, that we all may know the one that God sent. So being in this relationship with Jesus, experiencing uh, forgiveness and freedom and life, it is the best life there is. John says, John the, the Baptist is saying, this is the, this is the one. This is God's chosen one. This is the Messiah. Believe in him and have life. What's interesting is that John didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah initially. He even says a couple times, verse 31, I myself didn't know him. John's saying, I didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. It's not that he didn't know him, because like we mentioned uh, last week, John and Jesus were actually cousins, right? About six months apart in age, John came first. Then Jesus was born to Mary. And so he knew, I mean, he probably grew up knowing Jesus, but he didn't recognize his cousin, Jesus, as the Messiah. But he knew that he was on mission, and he says, I came baptizing uh, people with water so that the Messiah might be revealed to Israel. When the Messiah is going to be revealed to Israel, what, what we see is that the Messiah was actually being revealed to John. He didn't know ahead of time. Uh, he says it again, verse 32. John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, speaking of Jesus. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So when John sees this, you know, this... Uh, this beautiful moment where the Spirit of God comes down upon Jesus and remains on him, God had already told John, the one, when you see that, that's the one. He's my chosen one. And what's more is the Spirit that comes down on Jesus. He's, Jesus is going to be the one to actually baptize in this same Holy Spirit. Right? He's going to be the one who dis, dispenses it to people that God might live with us and among us as his people day in and day out. John 
got this revelation when all of Israel did. And through John, God says, here's the chosen one. Here he is. Uh, in that day, many, many Jews believed that the Messiah would be an obscure person, like he'd be living among us and we wouldn't know it. And that it would actually be Elijah that would reveal him. And so John kind of fulfills this purpose. There he is. There he is. What's John's bold testimony? This is the chosen one, but then he has this bold testimony that the scripture is actually both days. It's the same. Look, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the testimony that's been written down about Jesus. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John says that on day two, verse 29, and then the next day, day three, verse 35, the same phrase. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Why did he call Jesus the Lamb of God? And twice, you know, whenever Scripture repeats itself, it's something that you should say, didn't he just say this? Yes, he did. There's something to this, something important. Um, being Jews, of course, the Old Testament is full of um, kind of the, the sacrificial system where people could have their sins rolled back and, and uh, not held against them. And oftentimes, like it says in Leviticus 4.32, a lamb was one of the animals that was sacrificed uh, if, if someone, as, as an act of worship, but also as a you know, kind of a paying for their sin, because where there's sin, uh, there's death. The wages of sin is death. And to not pay the penalty of the sin yourself, another would have to take your place. And a lamb would take the place of the person or the household. And so in Leviticus 4, if someone brings a lamb as their sin offering, an offering for their sin, they are to bring a female without defect. This was part of the Old Testament sacrificial system. Um, we also see in the book of Exodus, of course, this epic story of God using Moses to bring his people out of captivity. And there is what we know of as the Passover lamb. And the Passover is still being celebrated among uh, Jewish people around the world. Um, it's changed in its form, but, you know, especially in the first century, still, to celebrate the Passover meant a lamb, there'd be a special lamb set aside that would die for that Passover celebration. It would actually be the, the lamb that they would then roast and that they would eat and celebrate what God had done for them in the Exodus story. If you remember, Moses... <laughs> You know, God used Moses for these 10 plagues against Pharaoh, who's hardening his heart, would not let God's people go. They were going to stay in captivity. And the last plague was this death angel that would fly over Egypt, and every firstborn would die. Animal, Egyptian, Jewish person. And the only way for your household, as a Jewish person, the only way for your household to escape this death angel killing the firstborn of your family was if you took a lamb and you sacrificed it and then you took the blood of the lamb and they were instructed to you know, use that blood and paint it over the doorpost. And when the death angel came over all the land of Egypt and firstborns were dying everywhere, there was so much weeping and wailing that night. But not in Israel. For those who took the Passover lamb and shed the blood of that lamb, the death angel would see that lamb over the doorpost and he would pass over that house. And so the Jews would celebrate the Passover every year because through this, God delivered them. Through this, they uh, you know, were saved and they would, they would feast on a Passover lamb every year. When John says, behold the lamb of God, there's so much imagery, and it's strong. And for the Jewish person in the first century, they would not miss this at all. They would understand. They would never have applied it to a person. That was probably the real confusing part for people that were hearing this. John's own disciples, when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, they probably didn't jump to the Passover lamb that needs to be slain. They, they probably didn't get there initially because you would never do that with a person. And yet, so it was still... It was still kind of confusing, potentially, but they would get the imagery. 
This was something God was doing, something God was providing, this Passover lamb. Uh, Jesus, as the lamb of God, John would say, is going to take away the sin of the world. And his death, as we know now, having read the end of the gospel, Jesus' death would remove the power of sin. Jesus' death would remove the penalty of sin. And his blood would be the salvation for all who, say it with me, believe. His blood would mean salvation for all who believe in him. The power of sin is removed. The penalty of sin is paid for. We celebrate that as God's people. The penalty of sin, the price that needs to be paid because of our sin, has been paid in full. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It's an accomplished work that Christ did on the cross, laying down his life, shedding his own blood for the sins of people so that we don't have to pay the penalty of our own sin. So when a believer becomes identified with Jesus, when we come to faith, right, and we, 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 we in our hearts, and we say, well, I actually believe this testimony about Jesus. History doesn't deny in the slightest that Jesus of Nazareth died on a Roman cross. That's a, that's a historical fact. No one would argue that. Faith steps in to say that that event, Jesus' death on a cross, was not a happenstance. It wasn't coincidence. It wasn't for nothing. It was actually very intentional. Jesus laid down his own life to be that Lamb of God, to take away the sins of all who would believe in him. He paid the penalty that we deserved. Uh, and the power and that penalty is removed from us. So when we identify him by believing, we begin to confess that we believe. Great confession, you know, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And I receive him as my Lord and Savior. When people begin to confess Christ, you're, you're being identified as one of his now. You repent of everything in your life that is not of God. All the weeks and months and maybe years and years that you have lived, you know, giving God the stiff arm, not wanting Jesus a part of your life. You repent of everything like that and you say, I, I believe. Jesus begins by the power of his Holy Spirit to begin to recreate you from the inside out to become more like him. Scripture is very clear that God's agenda for us is to recreate us into the very image of Jesus. And we all have a ways to go. None of us are there yet. But God is faithful in that work. When we are baptized into Christ, it's this moment where we are identified with him in his death, his burial, his resurrection to new life. We die to ourselves. We're buried in water, raised to walk a new life. We're given eternal life and the gift of God's spirit. This is what Christ has done for us. This is Jesus being the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Is it any, is it any doubt why people celebrate? Why do we celebrate the gospel? Because our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west and God remembers them no more. He drops them in the sea of forgetfulness. They're not held against us. At, uh, at so many of our gatherings, all of our worship gatherings, you know, we celebrate with communion. Do you understand why? Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's the resurrected King. He's the one we love. He's the one we live for. And in communion, we remember what he has accomplished for us, and we rest in it. We don't strive for it. We don't try to earn it. We know it's by grace we have been saved through faith. This not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Paul would write in his letter to the Ephesians. We sit, we eat, we drink, we remember, and we celebrate this Lamb of God who has taken away our sins, given us eternal life. You understand why we celebrate communion? We're going to again today, but before we do, 
I want to kind of tell the rest of the story about John the Baptist. Uh, both Matthew and Luke, if you turn to the previous book, the Gospel of Luke, both Matthew and Luke tell this about John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one who said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that he had doubt later on. I mean, weeks and months later we see this. In Luke chapter 7, verse 18, uh, Jesus, in 16 and 17, tell us how this news about Jesus was going all over the countryside and he was, he, people were proclaiming, God's, God's given us a great prophet in Jesus. And so in verse 18, John the Baptist, his disciples told him about all these things. Now, the backstory that you should know is that John was in a prison. The King Antipas thrown him in prison. And he had been there a long time. And it was likely, and the rest of the story we know, he would never leave that prison. He would be beheaded at the whims of, uh, you know, a young girl's mother, king's wife. And so John was in prison. He had had this ministry as the forerunner. He was the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He's the one who said, behold, the Lamb of God. And he confessed and testified that this was God's chosen one. And yet, we have written this account of John. His disciples tell him. They come to, he's not seeing it. He's in prison, but they are able to visit. And they say all that they had seen, and he called two of his disciples. He sent them to the Lord Jesus to ask, get this question. Because if you're struggling with doubt today, take heart in this question. Ask the Lord, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Maybe you're in a place, you know, maybe it feels like prison to you. Maybe it's dingy and dark. Maybe you're in a darkness that you created. Maybe you're wondering, you know, you've heard about the power of God to save, but it doesn't feel like it's saving you much at all. Wherever your doubt has led you, see it here. The scripture is honest. And John the Baptist was doubting, and he's like asking Jesus, are you the one? Jesus could have said, John, you said I was the one. Why are you asking if I'm the one? You're the one who declared, I am, this is the one. Jesus doesn't respond. See, what John did, which was really, really smart, which we should do when we struggle in darkness and doubt, is we should take our doubt, we should take our question and bring it to Jesus. John was doubting if this was all true or not, but at least he did the smart thing and he took the question to Jesus. We should do the same thing when we're in a season of discouragement or doubt. Are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Or should we be looking for someone else? Verse 20, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed, a reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury or in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet... This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. 
Do you hear the Lord's tenderness, compassion to John? That same kind of tenderness and compassion he has for us when we're in darkness and discouraging times, when we're doubting, we're not sure we believe. Do we believe? Is this for real? That same encouragement, because the warm words from Jesus, he could have been, you know, like, I can't believe John. What happened to his faith? He did not throw rocks at John or his faith. In fact, he actually says, you know, he lifts him up as a prophet and the greatest prophet ever. This is me. Jesus is never like surprised by our doubt. He's also not overly concerned about our doubt. He understood that John was in prison. Things had not gone the way the forerunner of the Messiah could have imagined they should go. If I'm the voice of one preparing the way for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, it should be a a magnificent and wonderful experience. Start to end, it wasn't for John. He lost his head in the end. But Jesus says, there's no one greater except one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Humility is the way, right? Meekness. Being somebody who is honest. And when we're experiencing trouble, when we're experiencing doubt, we just take all that to Jesus. And by the power of his spirit, this is the testimony of the church, we are encouraged in our hearts. We are strengthened in the inner person. We're able to walk out this life of faith because God is with us. Jesus never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Um, As we celebrate communion today, understand the gracious, loving kindness of our Savior. He does not condemn us, and his grace is sufficient for all who will trust in him. Will you trust in him today? Peter said it well, you know, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. He says, since, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from the ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish, defect or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who has raised him from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and your hope are in God. As we celebrate communion today, place your faith and your hope in God. Celebrate this precious blood of Christ, this Lamb of God who takes away all of your sins. Bring any doubts, bring questions, bring struggles to the one who knows you best. Spend these moments in prayer and commune with the living Savior. Let's eat and drink and let's remember Christ.